Good morning or maybe good afternoon. This is Xixiong at the University of Missouri. I'm an associate professor in turf grass science. And today I'm going to present some of our recent research findings about control couple difficult to control weeds that including yellow nussage and full screen cunning. So first of all, both of the two weeds belong to the same family and the family that some people would refer it as sedge family. By saying that, those two weeds share some of the traits together, which would be helpful for us to develop a control strategy. So in the sedge family, so they one of the most important or one of the most difficult to control weeds is the purple nosage. And unfortunately, we don't have that because that's more a southern weeds. And in our state, except the um, Blue Hill, probably we don't see the purple nosage, but we do see yellow nosage in our state. And then for the Kalinga genus, there are six species of them. And the green Kalinga is more a southern issue. And for us, we do have false green Kalinga in our, in our state. And this is the more a new emerged weed. That's why right now that we put a lot of effort on there to develop control strategies. So first of all, we want to talk about the appearance of why they are difficult to control weeds. So for yellow nosage, I'm sure you all have dealt with yellow nosage in the past. And for the um, striking future or trend, angular stem and they this is this picture showing you that they are growing here in the um, Caribbean bent grass turf and here is an azoish grass fairway they appear to be a uh, single shoes but if you dig down look at what is underneath that you found that the primary shoes can produce the secondary shoes through the rhizome and then they produce the tubers so because they have tubers that's why they are called not sedge and because also the tubers rhizomes all uh, serve as a uh, the storage organ so often those species are very difficult to kill. That's why some people even claim that those not sedges are impossible to control. Now here, what we are doing here is showing you that a way um, planted one single shoot of the yellow not sedge at the end of the May and in uh, this is a trough we used and over time we see that started to produce multi shoots and they try to grow as much as possible but this trough obviously confined where they can grow, but we can see that they started putting multi shoots and when it come to September, the shoots are much just significantly increased and this is what they look like in October. We had a similar study done throughout the winter months in 2019 and 2020. And in those winter months, one single shoe actually produced a total of 215 shoes. That's why they're so difficult to control. Now, when it comes to the full screen Kalinga, they look different. They don't look like a single shoe. Actually, on the turf, they more look like a patches. So here, what you see is different color patches from different from distance. But if you take a close look, you can see those patches. The size of that you can you can tell with uh, compare with the golf ball here. They'll even produce the sea head underneath a typical fairway mowing height, which is a half inch. Now here, my finger is showing you what their sea head looks like. Their sea head does look very different compared to the you know, not sedge. And if we take a close look, you can find that they don't produce tubers, but they do produce very strong rhizomes. Now, and more tissues, that's why they more appear to, you know, patches rather than uh, single shoes. So you might ask, what did I do wrong? Why did I have, why do I have this weed suddenly? And I didn't have this weed in the past or well, right now, why there's an issue? So in addition to climate change that might play a role here, one of the things actually research found is not because you did something wrong. Actually, the answer for that question is very opposite. It's because you did something right. So the reason for that is our practice for using pre-emerging herbicide to control some of the summer annuals like a crabgrass has shifted the weed species. So remember, we are dealing with a monoculture standard, which is very unnatural. So, so inevitably, we are going to have different weed species coming and infest that stand. And our practice does affect what type of species we're going to have there. So with that understanding, let's move to the strategy. So how are we going to control them? So we first need to understand that we are dealing with uh, 
perennial species with strong underground storage organs like a tuberous rhino. So our goal is not just to go ahead to burn the above ground shoots, which would be easy, but our goal is how we can most effectively to deliver the herbicide to below ground shoots and kill those um, tubers and uh, tubers and rhizomes. Now, since they are perennial, we don't have the luxury to use pre emergent herbicide, so we have to rely on post emergent herbicide. And most of the strategy will tell you that the first application should be put down when they just start to emerge. When the plant is small, when they start, when they have not started putting multi shoots or the tubers. And this is the best time to put on a treatment. And of course, we know for dealing with difficult control with, we are unlikely to totally control them just with one application. So the second application totally is, is typically more and typically is take four to six weeks apart before you put down the second application. And right now in our turf market, there's a different type of herbicide products out there to control those two weeds. And one type is contains LS inhibitors. So that including holosulfon, which is such a hammer, I'm sure many of, of us are very familiar with that. Another category of the herbicide to a PBO inhibitor like a sulfentronone dismisses one of the product for that. So I'm sure you have some experience with that. And there are also some product content more than one active ingredient. Now move to some of our research. Here I'm going to show you first is our field experiment we did in 2019. That was to control the yellow nosage on the Bermuda grass turf that was mowed sh shorter than half inch. So what we are showing you here is the percent of cover of the yen nosage over time from before we put on treatment until 15 weeks after the first time we put on treatment. We did put down two applications. The first application was the middle of June and the second application is about five weeks after the first application. So what we found is before we put on treatment, this plot is uniformly infested anywhere between 13 to 18% of the yen nosage. And it started to two weeks, we started to observe the reduced coverage of the loss in all treated plot, but I wanted to uh, call your attention for those three treatments that I'm highlighting here that are dismissed, dismissed next, and sanitary. What you found is at a two weeks, which is represented by green color bars, that there are no um, visible yellow nosage in those plots treated with those three treatments. So that was great. That was before we put on the second application. If the story just ended here, we will be very happy, right? Unfortunately, we don't have the nostrils. So by four weeks after that, we see that a yellow nostril started to grow, regrow from all the plots, including those three plots. This is the plots received those three treatments. And then that's when we put on the second application in week five, and then up to 15 weeks which is end of September of 2019, we didn't see any yen nosage, pretty much all the treaty plus, which is great, right? You might think the story ended up here. Yeah, we don't have to do that yet, but unfortunately that's not the fact. So what we did is 2020, we went back to the same plots and this time we didn't put down any treatment. Instead, we started to count the germination of the yen nosage shoots in each plot. So as a result, we found that without any treatment in 2019, we had about 50 something shoots germinated in the control plots. And some of our treated plots, remember previous year towards the end of the season, we didn't see any of the yen nosage, yet we see 40 plus. So that's not much different, even the statistical different, but this is not something we can accept as a standard. So as a professional turf manager, we will still go out to those plots to put down treatment in those in those areas where they received the treatment in 2019. So we will do the same as in 2020 again. But I do want to pay attention on these two treatments that is dismissed next and solitaire. So those two treatments ended up with substantially less more than 50% less of the shoots germinate during the summertime 2020 without receiving any treatment in 2020. So what that means is the treatment put down in those two treatments actually killed some below ground tissues and it was less germination in the year following that. So which is exciting. So understand what I said, just said earlier, dismiss, dismiss the next and the sanitary. Those are only three treatments in this treatment group that contains 
and contains substantial the PBO inhibitor and dismiss next and dismiss solitary actually contains more than one active ingredient. So actually dismiss contains sulfentanyl only, dismiss next actually contains sulfentanyl and cofentanyl are not the PBO inhibitor. So those are two promising treatments we found from this experiment. And we did done some um, the uh, trial on the fourth green Kalinga here. I'm showing you a greenhouse experiment that we all put down the treatment only one time. And then for the plant growing the pots, and we evaluate how much the herbicide injury other at one and two weeks after putting down the treatment. What we found again, similar pattern as the treatment effect on the um, you know, not said dismiss, dismiss next, and the solitary showed a fast action at the first and second way compared to all their treatment because the different mode of action. And here I'm showing you the, the representative pictures of what the plant look like at the eight weeks after with only one application. So we can see the control looks pretty good, very happy, healthy, and green. And the others all seem to have been beat down, but they all showed more or less green color except except one that is dismissed next. So we did have a field experiment going on right now with the fourth um, green Kaninga, but I want to wrap up this presentation with some of my final thoughts. First, I want to mention that it seems like products contains this PBO inhibitor sulfentrodon, especially the ones with multi-active ingredient like this next and the solitaire, they appear to be more promising and with more long lasting control for those two species. However, based on experiment, it seems like it is unlikely for us to totally eliminate these two species under field condition with only two applications per year. What that means is in the second year or following years, we will still have to go outside to put on treatment like what we did in the previous year. Then that bring a dangerous thing that is we need to make sure we rotate the herbicide with different mode of action to prevent select the herbicide resistant weeds because the literature already said that there are six different sedge species already developed as a uh, resistant to ALS inhibitors, including sedge hammer. So we don't want that to happen. And the third thing is without a new herbicide being introduced to the market, what can we do to boost our efficacy to control those two tough weeds? So one thing we need to understand is our goal is not to control the above ground shoes. Again, that's easy to burn, but our goal is to control above the below ground, the storage organ. How can we effectively to deliver the herbicide to the below ground um, storage organ, then we need to think about the traffic in the flow. And we know that when we spray a post-emerging herbicide, they will be absorbed by the foliar tissue, and then they will be trans transported to the uh, meristematic tissues in the flow -in. So the flow -in transportation goes two ways, not like one way is a line. -in. The two ways, not just up and down, this type of direction actually is from the source to sink. So what is the force for the direction of source to sink? Let me give an example. So in the spring, when the yellow knot is trying to grow from the tuber, so the tuber is the source and the sink is the shoot. So the traffic in the flow -in is going up. And when the fall comes, when the above ground stopped growing and they are trying to uh, um, move all the nutrient and uh, and uh, copper hydrate down to the storage organ so the traffic in the flow is go downward so that's the time we need to apply the herbicide to hopefully that the flow and traffic would move the herbicide to the below ground storage organ to more effectively kill those tubers or rhizomes. So by saying that, our second or even maybe third application need to be later in the season, likely later part of summer or the beginning of the fall. And by saying that, I want to wrap up this presentation by thanking my people who work very hard to deliver this presentation for you. And here's my contact information. If you have any question about the race or how to control sage on Kusin, which we did a trial on that too, please feel free to contact me with that. I want to thank you for your attention and good luck with the weed control. <laughs>